Welcome everyone to our third uh, and last day of the USC AI Futures Symposium this week on artificial intelligence and data science. We have uh, three great sessions today to end our symposium. And I would like to introduce the session chair for our first session on making decisions, Jose Luis Ambite. Jose Luis is research team leader at the Information Sciences Institute of the USC Viterbi School of Engineering and a research associate professor of computer science. Jose Luis. Yeah, thank you, Yolanda. Uh, so welcome everybody to the session on making decisions. Uh, we have an excellent set of speakers that will explore the interplay of knowledge, action, and learning. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Bistra Dilkina. Uh, she's an associate professor of computer science um, and a and the co-director of the Center for AI and Society, uh, which is a joint between the Viterbi School of Engineering and the Dirac Peck School of Social Work. Uh, Professor Dilkina research is at the intersection of discrete optimization and machine learning uh, with a focus on decision and optimization problems in sustainability and sustainable development. And she's going to tell us about how to learn to make decisions. Uh, Istra. Yeah, thank you, Jose Luis. And uh, really happy to be here and share some of my work in this space. Um, so um, a lot of my work uh, is motivated by trying to leverage artificial intelligence for sustainability and social good applications. In achieving sustainable development, we need to design policies to manage limited resources for the best possible impact. And that means that these problems really translate into large scale optimization and machine learning problems. Therefore, computer scientists and particular AI researchers um, really have a big role to play in, in helping meet that uh, um, grand challenge for our society. And so um, in the Center for AI and Society at USC, our mission is to develop, test, iterate, and demonstrate how AI can be used to tackle the most difficult societal problems and we work in many different areas, but in particular, three of them that I have been involved in are biodiversity conservation, disaster resilience, public health and well-being. And a guiding principle is to really always partner with um, uh, between computer science operations, research, social work, and domain experts and stakeholders in these areas. Next slide, please. So. Um, in, in, in solving these problems and also many other industry applications, one thing is for sure, we are trying to so solve larger and larger problems or at finer and finer resolution scale, meaning that the, the, there's more decision variables to be made. And we are also applying AI to new uh, decision-making contexts. So we have new problem structure that we might have not seen before. And so therefore we really need to improve our ability to solve this NP hard resource allocation and combinatorial problems if we want to be able to leverage limited resources to the best possible uh, impact. And so one uh, thing that uh, I have really leveraged in, in my work is to actually uh, uh, identify potential for close synergies between machine learning and combinatorial optimization. Traditionally, these two have been really addressed kind of in silos by different type of researchers, uh, um, while they actually have a lot to, to do with each other. In particular, uh, one team that I will tell you a little bit more today is trying to infuse discrete optimization algorithms with machine learning, really augment uh, algorithms with learning components, treat the data from optimization instances as um, supervised uh, learning data for ML models that can help us guide our algorithmic strategies and learning to decide. Uh, similarly, though, we can also think about how to integrate combinatorial optimization into machine learning models when we know that the predictions from those models will be used in downstream resource allocation. And therefore, having that knowledge and in including it as an inductive bias in our ML training is uh, something that can have dramatic uh, benefits to, to our final quality of our decisions. And so I will not talk about this team today, but that's also a very important way of integrating ML and optimization. Next slide, please. So there's uh, uh, the usual ways that in which we tackle uh, discrete optimization NP hard problems into find some exact algorithms uh, that are usually are based on some form of research that can guarantee optimality, but are worst case exponential. 
or if we're lucky, exploit problem structure and get approximation algorithms, or finally design some kind of heuristics or local search. And so each new problem domain that might require a lot of uh, optimization expertise to get those things working. But in a realistic setting, usually the same problem is solved repeatedly with slightly different data. Think about uh, a delivery company in LA where every day they have to uh, uh, you know, decide which routes their trucks are gonna take. And from day to day, the differences are that the, the, the requests for service are different, right? So really what we want is we want to be able to um, exploit the fact that we have a distribution of optimization instances in order to tailor heuristics automatically. And so here is, this is really the big opportunity for machine learning. How can we design our algorithms such that they can actually automatically discover strategies that work well for a specific distribution of NP-hard problems, not just any you know, instance of that type. Next slide, please. And so I will show you how this idea can work in many different algorithmic templates. Let's start with the greedy heuristic, which is used in many uh, uh, real world scenarios, in particular for graph optimization problems is very popular. For problems like minimum vertex cover, mean cut, and the traveling salesman problems, which occur in many uh, uh, real world applications, there's tons of different greedy heuristics where you insert one node at a time into a partial solution based on some scoring rule that tells you, okay, select the node with the highest degree, select the node that's furthest away from the current tour, et cetera. And some of those uh, nice uh, heuristics have actually approximation guarantees. Well, what we want to do is we want to throw away those uh, engineered rules. Uh, Rules. And given a graph uh, problem and a family of graphs, we want to learn that scoring function automatically. Next slide, please. And so if you actually think about the greedy algorithm as a sequential decision-making process in which you basically decide which node to add to the solution one at a time, you really can uh, uh, think of it as a um, prime uh, subject for a reinforcement learning approach. And that's exactly what we did. We treated the greedy algorithm as a, as a reinforcement learning problem. So we didn't need to uh, have uh, um, optimum solutions for training. And we train a scoring function to tell us which vertex to, um, to add next based on the performance of the policy on the particular max cut or TSP problem. And then the second challenge that we solved is that instead of doing uh, uh, using some kind of engineered features, which again are going to tie us to a specific domain and domain expertise, we actually use deep representation learning, meaning that we didn't uh, we can just leverage the graph structure, no matter what that graph is and what the problem is, to to use for features within our reinforcement learning. And so, with a combination of those two uh, techniques, actually results in, um, in amazing uh, computational advantages. Next. So here you can see our uh, results are comparing on vertex cover, max cut, and TSP. And our uh, approach in dark blue is almost invisible in the top two graphs because we actually learn to generate almost nearly optimum solutions uh, and beat a standard approximation heuristics for this problem, as well as a pure deep learning approach that uh, existed at the time, which was just trying to have a neural network predict the solution automatically. So definitely a, a huge advantage. Another algorithmic template is tree search. Tree search uh, is used in, in order to find optimum solutions with guarantees, but it has that worst case uh, complexity in terms of runtime. In particular, tree search has been uh, used for solving mixed integer linear programs, which are problems that can be expressed as integer and continuous variables with linear constraints and linear objective, and has amazing, a tremendous number of industrial applications from conservation planning to airline scheduling, etc. And there, tree search is really the branch and bound search. And again, although we have the algorithmic template, which guarantees optimality by the way that it's designed that we're gonna explore uh, uh, this tree search uh, tree in, uh, in a systematic way, there's many, many heuristic components that are up for grabs to be improved that dramatically can change where are you in terms of your typical case performance, not worst case performance. And one important strategy is branching. Which variable are we going to split on in our tree search next? And that can have dramatic effect. And there's some good strategies about uh, how to branch, but they're too expensive to compute explicitly during search, so people don't use them in practice. 
So what did we do? We basically said, well, our branching strategy, again, is going to be a learnable component. We're going to learn it offline from our distribution of instances to try to imitate this strong branching, which is this very high overhead uh, heuristic where which can, we can afford to collect data offline and then on at a test time, at deployment time, just use our neural network that imitates strong branching with, for a much faster recommendation for branching. And so um, next. And, and so here basically at offline time when we are collecting data, we are going to perform this full look ahead, try to branch on every variable, collect features that represent each variable in that uh, search tree node, and uh, record how good was the, the score in terms of the strong branching and use that for supervised learning. In particular, we train a ranking model to tell us which variable would be best. Now, when we apply this to real world distribution of problems in wildlife corridor design for conservation planning and in network design for uh, road resilience to disasters, we see that in blue, our learning to branch strategy is able to dramatically improve the optimality gap of the solutions that we get from 15% optimality gap to only 1%. Uh, which is basically uh, getting much better guarantees and much better solution quality for our applications within the same time cut cutoff, which is two hours. These are really hard problems. Even in two hours, you cannot find an optimum solution. Next. And so finally, in a, in a quick slide, one uh, final family of algorithmic templates is local search. And in particular, large neighborhood search is a strategy where you have a, a current solution it's kind of like uh, destroy and repair. You choose a subset of the variables, you unassign them, you destroy them, and then you reassign them in the context of all the variables being frozen, right? Trying to locally improve your solution. And so that's a very common template that is used in many different applications, but it's also used to solve mixed integer programs. And what we did is we said, well, choosing how to partition these variables and which ones to unfreeze has a dramatic impact again on the behavior of this algorithm, this neighborhood component. So we decide, well, let's learn it instead of engineer it. And so using again, a combination of reinforcement learning, in particular imitation learning, we were able to create uh, this partitioning strategy for large neighborhood search that's able to generate a thousand time improvement in wall clock time in solving, uh, in finding good solutions to very hard optimization problems. So, in conclusion, I guess I hope that I have convinced you about the potential of this paradigm of learning driven algorithm design. So as we are designing our algorithms that will help us decide and allocate limited resources, we have to think about what components of these algorithms are actually don't have to be hard coded and engineered, but in fact can be thought of as learnable parts that can be automatically tailored to specific distributions in order to infer strategies from uh, uh, problem data. And there's so many more opportunities of doing uh, uh, additional work in that, in that area and really creating this very tight bridge between the machine learning and the combinatorial communities. And that's all from me, thanks. Well, thank you so much, Bistra. That's a very exciting uh, line of research. Right? Um, so um, we will have questions at the end, but please post them in the QA window. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Shatis uh, Tita Maranahali. Um, he is a research lead at the Information Sciences Institute and a research assistant professor of computer science, industrial and system engineering, and physics and astronomy, uh, all at USC. Uh, professor Tita Maranahali uh, has wide interest in algorithmic techniques for artificial intelligence, and today he's going to tell us about his work on constraint optimization. Uh, Satish. Uh, Satish, I think we cannot hear you. Sorry about that, I was muted. Um, uh, so welcome everyone. So let's uh, talk about constraint optimization a little bit. Um, and let me uh, start with an example. So suppose I'm uh, considering um, taking eight courses, let's say in the next two semesters. And I have constraints as well as preferences. So my constraints could be, for example, that you know advanced calculus is a prerequisite for quantum mechanics, or that if I consider taking sociology and organic chemistry in the second semester, then I have conflicting times. 
Um, and I could have some preferences. Maybe I prefer to learn quantum mechanics with a certain professor, but she teaches it only in one of the semesters. And in general, maybe I like afternoon classes over the morning classes and things like this. So in this timetabling problem, the task is to satisfy all the constraints and maximize the sum of the preferences. And it's an example of a constraint optimization problem. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so if you look a little bit deeper into this problem, you can identify what the variables are, what domains are, the constraints and the preferences. So the variables in this problem uh, could be propositions, uh, things like whether I take advanced calculus in semester one or quantum mechanics in semester two. And uh, the domains are just, you know, possible values, like in this case, they're just true and false. And what used to be constraints that were stated in uh, natural language are now constraints that can be rewritten using logical operators. And preferences can also be made into quantitative um, numbers. For example, you know, taking quantum mechanics with my favorite professor could yield a reward of eight out of 10 for me. In general, um, constraints and preferences put together are referred to as relations or relationships between the variables. Next slide. So this is actually the nature of constraint optimization problems in general, where there are a bunch of variables, there are domains, and a bunch of relationships or relations sitting on subsets of the variables. And the task is typically to find um, an assignment of values to all the variables from the respective domains so that a score is maximized. The score itself is derived from the relations, which is which is the constraints and the preferences. And the problem domain per se, it doesn't matter what it is. I mean, we could be talking about recovering a spacecraft from a failure mode or a certain task on a knowledge graph or coordinating robots in a large warehouse or trying to understand the microstructure of a certain material based on its macroscopic observable properties. Um, all these problems are actually constrained optimization problems, although there's a certain kind of art in recognizing what the variables are, what the constraints are, what the, what the, object, what, what the objective function is, and so forth. So typically in constrained optimization problems, the task is to find an optimal solution. Um, by brute force um, enumeration of all possibilities, this is prohibitively expensive because in some of these domains, the number of combinations that you have to go through is more than the number of atoms in the universe. So that's not feasible. A lot of intelligence in AI actually comes from going through all these combinations of values to the variables, not explicitly, but only implicitly. And how far we can go by implicit enumeration instead of explicit depends on how well we are able to exploit structure between the relationships in the, in the variables. And different communities have contributed different methods for exploiting structure. Um, although their original problem of motivation could have been something that was very particular to that domain, right? but their ultimate contribution has been how to exploit structure um, in the relations between, uh, between variables. And there are several communities that have been active in this. I mean, just to name a few are artificial intelligence, machine learning, constraint programming, and operations research. Next slide. <laughs> so if we understand all these different methods of, of exploiting structure, then you know, wonderful things can unfold from here. Um, and you know, one benefit is that cross-fertilization of ideas. And our lab has been doing this quite effectively, taking ideas developed in one community and applying them to problems of interest in another community. Just to give you two examples here, we have taken um, you know, the results that, that were developed in the randomized algorithms community, something about convergence properties of random walks and graphs, and converted that into a polynomial term algorithm for doing optimal scheduling in the smart home domain for, with energy minimization. Um, and uh, a second idea, we've taken ideas from data mining and converted that into a graph embedding algorithm that works only in linear time. And in turn, we have converted that into a state-of-the-art algorithm for shortest path computations. All right, next slide. Um, another benefit of understanding the work of different communities is that for a, for a real world problem, which appears to be too complex, we would understand how to peel the complexities of this problem domain in the right order and make use of different pieces of work in, at the right level. For example, we have been very active in this warehouse robotics scenario. Here, there are a bunch of robots that are running around shipping items from one location to another. And if you look at the scenario here, there are complex kinematic constraints on 
individual robots, as well as coordination constraints between robots because they cannot be running into each other. And then of course the system has to be robust because you know, if one robot fails, then you know, it cannot block the other robots and what are we going to do in such cases? And uh, from end, and end to end, we also need to optimize things like the total throughput of the system. So it looks like a very complex real world problem, but if we look at it, if we peel the complexities in the right order at every abstraction layer, you will see that different communities work become relevant. For example, if you ignore the kinematic constraints and concentrate only on the uh, coordination constraints, you can model this as a graph theoretic problem and declare the NP hardness of this problem. Um, and after the theoretician walks away with this, uh, uh, declaring this negative result, the AI guys can still come in and give a practically viable solution for this graph theoretic problem, still under certain assumptions, but that's not the point. The point is that they're doing combinatorial heavy lifting through the AI solvers. After you do the combinatorial heavy lifting through the AI solvers, the roboticist can then come in and post-process the solution and reinstate the kinematic constraints and actually develop velocity profiles for all the robots. And, and, and there are still some bigger questions to be answered uh, from a bird's eye view as to where you should station the idle robots so that in, in anticipation of future demand, so that you know, they can get to the items very quickly. These kinds of problems begin to look like physics problems where you have to consider receptor and ligand binding. Okay, so next slide. So speaking about exploiting structure, one of the things that we have done is the idea of the constraint composite graph. So traditionally, there have been two schools of thought for exploiting structure. One school of thought has considered the microstructure or the nature of the relationships between the variables themselves. The other kind of, uh, the other school of thought is they're not so much interested in the nature of the relationship between variables, but simply which variables are interacting with which other variables. This is the macro level structure of the graphical structure. So the constraint composite graph that we developed exploits both of these in the in a unifying framework. And because it exploits both of them simultaneously, it is more powerful than either of them uh, independently. And you know, the, many things unfold from here. Um, uh, just to name a few of the idea of kernelization, which is how to run a max flow procedure even before search starts to reduce the number of variables. The second is that it has led to a state of the art algorithm for distributed optimization. And the third is it has applications in quantum computing. For example, it, instead of solving your problem directly on the quantum annealer, it is much better to embed the constraint composite graph of it instead. And end to end, we have a better solution. Next slide. Um, the other framework that we're working on is the top K solution framework. Now, this is a place where we are interested not just in the optimal solution of the of the problem, but the top K solutions of it. This is important for two reasons. One is if we are considering AI systems interacting with humans, then generating the optimal solution all the time by the AI system is too brittle because it assumes that the environment is fully modeled or human preferences are fully modeled, or even if that were not the case, I mean, things could go wrong at execution time. So just like when we do a Google search and we expect many results and not just the top result, in the same way, we we want to generate the top case solutions to create a more robust system. And of course, this can be done within the framework of constraint optimization, because generally speaking, to generate the case solution, we just have to add constraints that prohibit the previously generated K minus one solutions. From, from a computational physics perspective as well, generating the top case solutions is very interesting because it really bridges the gap between the macroscopic world and the microscopic world. Um, this is really by virtue of the Boltzmann equation uh, from statistical mechanics, which relates the macroscopic observables to the top case solutions of microscopic spin models. So what you see on the left-hand side here is actually physical magnetic hysteresis curves of two kinds of steel. And what you see on the right-hand side is purely a combinatorial simulation of it based on our top case solution framework. Okay, next slide. So uh, overall, if I were to make a statement about the future of AI from the perspective of uh, constraint optimization, then uh, you know I think this is rather evasive and I wouldn't like to fix myself to 
um, to, to thinking of it one way or the other. But I think we can sow the seed of possibilities by investing in combinatorics. Essentially, algorithm designed for how to go through a large number, a large number of combinations very fast and pick the suitable ones. So in other words, the future of AI is algorithm designed for combinatorics. Um, and appropriately enough, the name of my lab is CATI, which is Collaboratory for Algorithmic Techniques and Artificial Intelligence, which people are welcome to look up online. Thank you very much. Thank you, Satis. Um, again, please uh, pose your questions in the Q and A. We know. Uh, so next, we we have uh, Professor Jan Liu. Um, uh, Jan is the Philip and Kelly McDonald Endowed Early Career Chair and Professor of Computer Science, and she's the Director of the Machine Learning Center at the Viterbi School of Engineering at USC. And Professor Liu will describe how physics knowledge can inform machine learning. Thank you, Jose yeah. Luis. Uh, hi, everyone. Good morning. So today I'm going to share some of our recent endeavor on physics informed machine learning models. So uh, AI has uh, started to play a major role in many type of uh, societal level uh, of problems. For example, uh, can we move to the next slide? Yeah. Uh, for example, that uh, many researchers have started to look into how we can design AI solutions for climate change, smarter transportation, or smart power systems. As we go from, uh, as we move from all the traditional AI um, applications, where basically we're constrained with a limited environment, now we're moving to this physical world where we're going to ex be exposed to a significant increase in terms of number of observations and also different type of um, uh, constraints and uh, different type of um, uh, rules that we're going to consider. So. Um, a grand challenge problem that we need to address as the whole community in uh, AI is that, did we actually re uh, reach a limit uh, on data-driven approaches? That is, can it, the data tell everything to train a model? So one of the fundamental questions obviously is that, all these existing AI models, they're trained really well on the observation data with large amount of data. And in addition, many of the cases we were given the a, a, a right amount of labels to train the model. But on the other side, it, it is very hard to actually do efficient and effective feature learning when they're not uh, the explicit labels were given. So uh, here that we just show some uh, um, uh, a simulation data where you can see that basically we can have the position and velocity, and then we're just trying to see how these objects will move in uh, the two dimensional space. Uh, the deep neural network can basically learn easily the mapping, but on the other side, when we expand it to this huge dimension, uh, then we're going to encounter a very uh, big issues. Uh, next slide. Another challenge we're facing is that uh, we are trying to learn uh, this particular model, for example, uh, for computer vision or face recognition. And it is very much uh, uh, susceptible to these adversarial noises. Uh, and we can easily uh, change, make some changes on the training data so that the model doesn't work anyway. And therefore that we want to develop a model that can actually be robust to this uh, different type of adversarial attacks in terms of the data from different distributions. Next slide. And the third is that it is in general very hard to get large amount of labeled data in the first place. And therefore given all these challenges that uh, we basically are in great demand of a strong and generalizable inductive biases so that we can achieve a robust and efficient learning. Next slide. And there where the physics aware uh, models actually comes into place. Again, to just to motivate it in terms of the data-driven approaches, we got all these different type of sensor data or other type of uh, uh, satellite data. It's very easy to collect observations for the phenomenon. However, due to the searching space that we're uh, exposed to, there's no way that we will be able to construct uh, a reliable prediction model based on the data-driven approaches itself. 
And therefore that we think it will be very interesting and also very timely to consider this particular direction where we're going to actually build an effective hybrid model, which will be able to take into consideration and benefit from uh, both world. That is the data-driven approaches together with the physics informed information so that we can provide a more generalized inductive biases. Next slide. So in the past uh, uh, three or four years, in our group, we have been working towards this particular direction. We want to have data dream approaches and physics knowledge together. And then we basically can um, uh, summarize that there are basically two types of inductive biases we might want to consider. One is this general inductive bias that is basically the physical knowledge will provide some general principles and we want to use them to help facilitate the data-driven approaches. And the other and the second direction is that we want to look into some task-specific inductive biases. In there, that's basically needs that we need to discover some of the physical principles that have not actually been discovered in the world, but we try to discover cover some of them more specific to the task and then we will be able to utilize them. So in this particular talk, I'm going to focus on giving just some examples and show flavor of what we can do using this general inductive biases and also hint a little bit on the task specific inductive biases. Next slide. So uh, in here that uh, there are many ways that we can actually incorporate the physical principles with uh, the data driven approach. Uh, so in here, we show a very interesting illustrative example where uh, we have these physical physics on the continuous domain, and this is basically all these different type of physics aware models. And on the other end, we look at all the observations, especially the spatial temporal observation, which are collected in very sparsely and irregular observed data points. So how we can actually translate these two different types of knowledge and data into something, into a uniform framework. And that is really a very, very key and important challenge. Most of the previous work were using uh, this physics knowledge, trying to incorporate them inside as a regularizer or as a prior knowledge. And we have studied this for a very long time. It turns out that as we go with the large amount of data, the prior knowledge or the regularization won't play a major role in actually devising a robust uh, and efficient model. And therefore we have to look for somewhere else. And a hint in there is that we're going to translate both the physics aware information and the uh, data into some uh, graph signals so that they can incorporate it inside the same work utilizing the graph neural network framework. Next slide. So uh, there are many physics related uh, dynamics equations. Uh, here we are going to show one particular example that is the temporal differences together with the spatial differences. For example, uh, many of uh, the PDEs actually share the following form. The temporal difference is actually a function of, special, uh, of spatial differences. For example, we have the heat equation, convention diffusion equation, and Navier strokes equation. They're all essential in the fluid dynamics and they demonstrate how the different function values can vary over the time with respect to the spatial differences. And this particular animation visualizes how the initial heat is dissipated in the space over the time. So if you um, observe this a little bit more carefully, we can see that the heat value at the location with different uh, spatial differences will have different changing rate with respect to the time. And therefore, knowing the spatial differences should be able to help us predicting the physics-based dynamics. Uh, so in the next slide, we're going to show our specific model. Uh, next slide, yeah, sorry. Mm. Next one, yeah. Uh, this is the model we propose. We call this as physics aware difference graph neural network, uh, or known as PADGN. The work was published uh, in iClear last year. And in here, basically, that we have two components. One is the spatial difference layer. We call this as SDL. Basically, this is going to produce the modulated spatial differences based on these physical PDE equations. And then we're also going to have this prediction uh, module, which will be able to actually predict the next graph signals based on the signals that uh, graph signals that we generated from the SDL layer and also from the data that we learned. 
And in the end, we, are, we will be able to effectively incorporate both knowledge uh, in terms of spatial differences and also the data signals in graph, uh, in graph signal so that we'll be able to achieve better prediction performance. And that is basically you know, a high level idea how we can achieve so. Uh, another hint we want to give is that how we can actually derive task specific uh, uh, physical principles. And we achieved this by looking at a very interesting junction between causal inferences together with physics knowledge. So as we know that causal inference is basically the fundamental law and concepts in all these physical world. And one of the major one is an effect and not occur before it its causes. And therefore that when we consider these causes in the physical world and trying to model the spatial temporal observations, then uh, a lot of the time they, they may actually overlap uh, or at least show some particular different type of um, uh, contained information in terms of physical principles as well. So uh, sometimes that we do not know a lot of this prior knowledge and we want to learn from the causal perspective. On the other sense that we know these physical laws, then we will be able to actually identify the specific equations. For example, here we show the differential equation in the continuous domain. And with this particular equation, we will be able to divide, develop uh, a prediction uh, and also relations that we can incorporate it within the uh, neural network uh, using this particular equation that we derived. And then later, we want to say that this is one type of causal inferences that we already know. And then the model will hopefully discover more of the causal relationships at the same time while learning the predictions. So that in the end, we will get a better prediction model. We will also be able to uncover some of the causal relationships that have not been discovered uh, by the domain experts. And that is one sort of the basic idea for where we're going for this causal inference together with a physics informed knowledge for machine learning model. Uh, next slide. So hopefully that uh, by now I gave a good, quick overview in terms of endeavors on physics aware uh, learning model. And as we can see, there are many, many open spaces that we can explore in this particular domain. And even more importantly, this is going to show more general AI application to more societal level applications and for sustainability, climate change, and many of the things that are essential for the development of our society. Uh, so with that, I would like to just um, say thank you, everyone. And uh, yeah, I'll be happy to have discussions after the session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Jan. That was a fascinating talk. Um, so our next speaker is uh, uh, Professor Sven Koenig. Uh, he's a professor of computer science at the Viterbi School of Engineering. And Professor Koenig is interested in decision making for agents that operate in large, non deterministic non stationary, or partially known domains. And I haven't listed the many accomplishments of all the speakers, uh, but I should say that uh, Sven is a fellow of the ACM, IEEE, and AAAI, which is pretty cool. So please, Sven. Great, thank you. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, I want to talk about decision making for multi robot systems in logistics. Oops. And so, so these days we are living in an era of big data. So we have lots of data available and we use machine learning to learn models that make sense of the data. But I predict that soon we will be living in an era of big decisions where we use these models to make good decisions. And that doesn't just require machine learning. It also requires a bunch of decision-making techniques. And so my prediction for the future here is that one future of AI is in combining decision-making techniques from different disciplines. So let me explain this a little bit. So if we look into the most popular textbook in AI, Artificial Intelligence and Modern Approach by Russell and Norvig, then they tell us that a lot of AI is about building rational agents. And rational agents are agents that select actions that they believe maximize a given performance measure. So that shows us already that artificial intelligence in a way is about making good decisions. Now what AI researchers are doing though is they don't just develop their own techniques for making good decisions. They're also looking into neighboring disciplines and see what these disciplines have to offer. And then they integrate ideas for decision-making from those disciplines into artificial intelligence. And because of this, 
it is not very surprising that if we look into our textbook again, we'll see that that textbook talks about things like utility theory and multi-attribute utility functions. And of course, those are concepts that originated in decision theory. Our textbook also talks about things like game theory and auctions. And those are concepts that originated in economics. Finally, it also talks about stochastic dynamic programming methods like value iteration and policy iteration, and those originated in operations research. So that already shows you that we are making first steps towards a science of making good decisions by optimizing given objectives. And artificial intelligence is key for it, and not just machine learning, but also other artificial intelligence techniques like planning, for example. But so are all of these neighboring disciplines that also study how to make good decisions, like operations research, decision and utility theory, economics control theory, and a bunch of others. So let me make this a little bit more concrete by looking at an example, namely automated warehousing. And in particular here, I want to look at the Amazon fulfillment centers as an example of industry 4.0. And what that means is simply that we have lots of data available about the orders of customers, for example, lots of data about the system itself. And we need to use all of the data to make smart decisions. Now, the way these, these Amazon fulfillment centers work is that they store all of the products on special shelves. And when you order something like a teddy bear, for example, a robot goes into the warehouse, picks up the whole shelf, and then brings it to the perimeter of the warehouse, where at this point in time, still a human takes the, the teddy bear off the shelf, and then the robot takes the shelf back into the warehouse. So, so in the center of the warehouse, it's only robots operating. And the closest facility that, that Amazon has to us here at USC is in Tracy, California. So that's in uh, at a little bit closer to San Francisco, uh, where more than 3,000 robots operate on more than 100,000 square meters. Now, these uh, automated warehousing systems raise a lot of, of issues in making good decisions. And I list some of them here. So for example, how should one move the robots to avoid them obstructing each other? Uh, which one of several possible shelves should one fetch to obtain an item? Where should one place a given shelf so that the shelves that you need most often you can fetch very quickly? All the way to when should one start to process a given order? And I want to look at the first issue here, the most basic issue in, in one of these warehouses here in a little bit more detail, namely, how should one move the robots to avoid them obstructing each other? So that's a, a problem that's known as multi-robot pathfinding. And the idea here is that you have a bunch of robots in an environment, just like shown here. And uh, these robots need to move to, to given target locations. And all you have to do is you have to find paths for these, these robots so that the robots don't collide and so that they get to the target locations as quickly as possible, say, to minimize things like make span or flow time. Now, planning here is important, and I want to show this using a case study in one of the, the Amazon uh, robotic sorting centers. So you can see this at the bottom right, where robots move individual packages, like the one that contains my teddy bear, and drop them into chutes so that they get to the right loading docks. Now, the simulation that we see here, uh, the one that shows baseline, and I know that this will not show as smoothly on Zoom as I can see it here on my laptop, but this works like, you know, we work in our cars in traffic, you know, in Los Angeles. Uh, the robots plan individual routes to their target locations. Um, and then there are traffic rules that make sure that they don't collide, right? And the traffic rules basically determine how the robots should yield to each other. And I hope that one of the things you can see in this video here is that these robots bunch up. So we get these stop and goes that we know from Los Angeles traffic as well. And so that's not good for throughput. But a good planner, you know, like the one that I'm showing in the simulation on the right here, um, that's our own planner in this case, can completely avoid this issue, right? There's no bunching up, no stop and goes, so you get high throughput this way. But now the question is, what about machine learning, right? That's how we started this talk. And here we know that the DeepMind um, already, you know, a couple of years ago could learn Atari video games really well using uh, techniques from deep reinforcement learning. 
basically by giving the computer a controller, letting it watch the, the video screen, you can learn a, a large number of these, these early Atari video games extremely well. And so what we can do here is we can say, well, you know, we can model a multi-robot pathfinding problem as a video game. Um, and in fact, you can do this. What I'm showing here is robots executing a plan found by a, a state-of-the-art planner on the left and the machine learning system on the right. The machine learning system is a, a top-of-the-line state-of-the-art uh, machine learning system that combines this deep reinforcement learning with imitation learning, was trained for 20 days in a supercomputing center. And let's see how that looks like. So what we can see here is that uh, the plan of the planner is a little bit better than the one of the machine learning system, but that's okay because the machine learning system has a bunch of advantages, for example, makes it very easy to, to execute these plans in a decentralized way. Uh, most of the MAPF planners work in a centralized way. However, um, if we look at the obstacle density here, or 10%, you know, in warehouses, of course, we have a much higher obstacle density because we wanna put shelves everywhere. Uh, so let me change the obstacle density to 20% and rerun this. And hopefully now you'll see that, that the plan of the planner gets the robots quite speedily to their target locations. Uh, it turns out that the plan of the machine learning system eventually gets uh, the robots there, uh, but it takes a long time. So this end-to-end -end machine learning um, for this specific task with current technology, it doesn't quite work yet. And we see this also in, in other domains. So if we look at NeurIPS 2020, for example, so one of the top machine learning conferences, they held the Flatland competition there. So that's a train scheduling uh, competition uh, in which um, more than 700 participants from 51 countries participated in. And on the left here, we see sort of a small example of what people had to do. Uh, the larger problems involve thousands of trains. And you can see that there is a similarity to these warehouses because in the warehouses, we have these narrow corridors and two robots can pass each other there. On the uh, train systems here, we have these single tracks. And of course, trains can pass uh, each other there. Now we ended with Monash University, we did very well. But what I want you to look at at the leaderboard here on the right-hand side is the techniques that, that folks used. So we used um, a, um, a number of different techniques uh, blended together uh, from uh, artificial intelligence, decision-making and, and neighboring disciplines. The um, best machine learning techniques came in here, which is sort of a little bit surprising given that this was really meant to be a reinforcement learning competition. So again, you know, this end-to-end -end learning uh, doesn't quite work well in these domains. Of course, right, there is a place for machine learning here. And after we have listened to Bistra's talk, you know, in this session earlier, it'll not be a big surprise that we can enhance these planners with machine learning. That's a joint project with Bistra. And the reason for this is simply that planners make lots of hard-coded heuristic decisions. Like for example, you know, if, if two robots you know, are set to collide, uh, which collision to resolve next. And machine learning can often learn to make better decisions. And then the resulting planners can be more efficient, so can run much faster, or they can be more effective, they can find better plans. And that gets me back uh, to my overall prediction here, right? So what we have seen here is examples of, you know, blending sort of these different decision-making disciplines. And therefore, my prediction for the future of AI is that one of the future of, of AI is in combining decision-making techniques from different disciplines. Let me stop here, and I'm happy to take questions in the Q&A session. Yeah, thank you, Sven. Um, you know, a fascinating talk. So we have uh, some time for questions, and I see there's some questions in the Q&A. Um, so we're going to go th through those first, and then maybe I'll ask some general you know, questions. Uh, so first, uh, Anusha Avuk uh, asks, are there general principles for bringing domain knowledge to the prediction problem? For example, physics are where we have better understanding of physical laws. How can we build this for social sciences? So how can you, yeah? bring knowledge to, to learning in a general way. Maybe this is for Jan. Okay. Everybody. 
Sure, yeah, I'm happy to chip in my thoughts in here. Uh, so I agree that there, there are different type of uh, domain knowledge. And in here, what I illustrate is basically these physical principles. That is basically something that you can actually describe uh, or, uh, or abstract in a mathematical formula. Um, there are also a lot of uh, domain knowledge that cannot be directly translated in these mathematical partial differential equations. Uh, there are uh, different approaches to take into consideration. Some of them, you know, uh, will uh, generate the rules and more uh, generally that we can actually use uh, uh, some of the formal logic. Uh, I've been also working with a few researchers here at USC uh, on formal methods where we will be able to capture uh, these uh, temporal logic or general uh, logic. Uh, and then uh, utilizing these uh, representations, we can incorporate uh, this knowledge together with the neural network model. Uh, I think one of the major issues that we are uh, facing uh, when we actually try to uh, representing these domain knowledge with rules or other logic is that uh, they actually talk more in discrete language. And most of the existing models in neural network talking mostly in uh, this continuous language. And then how we will be able to have a unified framework that can actually uh, unify in both descript descriptors and also continuous modeling. I think that's really a major challenge. Obviously all the existing work we have done in machine learning area uh, is rather rudimentary and there are quite a few approaches uh, in here already developed. But I think uh, in the longer term that there is all these approaches in uh, these probabilistic um, uh, programming or uh, in more general uh, AI models hopefully can provide uh, uh, the final solution. But I think that at least for now that there is already all these different type of uh, approaches are uh, in there so that we can utilize. But at the same time for fundamental AI research, uh, this opens, also opens up the uh, playground for fundamental research in here as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's kind of the holy grail, how to bring all this knowledge into machine learning. Yeah, that's a thank you. great. Uh, um, thank you, Jan. So there's another question from Akshay Shinde. Um, so thank you for this inspiring and informative sessions. My question is for the top case solutions study. Uh, sometimes there are some hard constraints and some soft constraints. Um, so in this case, do we reduce the weight of the preferences to find the next -like solution? Or do we assume that the benefit of going ahead with some preferences without weight, a constrained component? And then remove that constraint. So I'm not sure very clear, but um, this is for um, Satish. Um, how do you kind of structure the different type of constraints in your in your solutions? Yeah. So I mean, my original point about exploiting structure in a constraint uh, is is the way to go here. And if you look at what happens in generating the kth solution, where we add prohibitive constraints to prevent the 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 k minus one solutions that have been generated so far each of these prohibitive constraints actually has a specific kind of structure it is a symmetric constraint so because it's not inter it's it essentially imposes a symmetric function on the participating variables and you know symmetric functions have a certain kind of property for example you can decompose a symmetric function on n variables into pairwise constraints with the introduction of some auxiliary variables so, uh, so yeah, the, the idea in, in generating the top key solutions is uh, each of these prohibitive constraints in every iteration is essentially a symmetric constraint that, that is decomposable. Okay, well, that answers the question from Ashley. Um, so Dimitar Kirillov has another question. Uh, when it comes to decision-making, are there tasks of areas in real life that we could safely let an AI system make a decision without human supervision? Uh, if not yet, what about sometime in the future? So that's a, how do you think this, I mean, how far do you trust all these methods, I guess? <laughs> Maybe I can get started, but I think it's really a question for everybody here. Uh, so the point is AI systems already make tons of decisions without human supervision. Now there are different kinds of decisions, right? If you look at the recommender system, for example, that recommends on Netflix, you know, which videos you wanna work, watch, right? If they get it wrong, it's not a big deal. You might have wasted your time. You watch a movie for five minutes. You don't like it, fine, right? There are, of course, much more important decisions to be made, um, but uh, self-driving cars on the road, and you will notice that um, problems do happen, right? Um, and so the question really is, is what can we do to make uh, these systems safer? 
And also, you know, to the extent where they need to get monitored, how can we actually enable humans to monitor all of these, these decisions, which can be very hard in some cases, right? If you think about stock market buy and sell decisions, which are made autonomously, and we have seen, you know, big problems on the stock markets because of this, um, they're done so fast that even if a human monitors this, they don't have time to intervene. And so this is a, a big area currently in AI um, of, of, of current research where people are trying to figure out, right? When should we trust the system? How can we make them more trustworthy? How can we make them fairer? How we can we avoid bias, for example? And I think the, the future will tell, uh, you know, with what uh, kind of, of, of systems we come up with. Uh, but AI researchers are certainly looking at this. I don't know if anybody wants to add yeah. anything. I guess just to add to what Aswan said, I guess obviously there is many, many areas in which people are trying to use AI where safety is a big issue. Anything that concerns humans, health, well-being, you know, um, education and so on, it's really difficult. There are applications which are more safely amenable to AI. And that's again, depends on what you call safety, right? So I would say human safety is the highest one, but you know, um, if you're willing to, let's say, in the warehouse example that Sven gave, uh, if the AI gets it wrong, the robots might crash, you would have an economic loss, right? So you might consider that's not safe enough, but in a sense, there's some applications which are, I guess, more technological where maybe some uh, of the ap approaches, at least right now, are, are more, more safely can be used than, than others, right? So anything that, again, consider society is much more difficult um, and human supervision and human oversight is needed. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, we haven't talked about in this session, but in other sessions, we talk about fairness too. So it's not just safety, but you're going to let an AI system kind of do some important decisions. You want to make sure there are other characteristics yeah. uh, like fairness. I, I guess if, if the person is asking for examples where is the opposite, right? We can list a lot of examples where there's a problem. But if you are looking for examples where maybe it's it's a it's a you know kind of more amenable ground, then I would say something like warehouses or precision agriculture, you know, uh, places where you know if the AI makes mistakes, it's it might not you know be safety critical, or you obviously still have to worry about economic costs and other things. Oh, thank you. So Yudwan has a couple of questions directed to Professor Koenig. Uh, I want to ask for the multi-agent uh, machine learning model, does it need different prepared map for the decision making using different ML model or same model for different maps and how to evaluate the overall performance for the related model? So how general again is are these kind of uh, running methods? Right. So the uh, short answer here is um, this does generalize um, across uh, different kinds of maps. Um, one of the nice things, though, in the warehouses is that the map, for the most part, is actually given in a warehouse. Um, what changes is, you know, where the robot should move, so the target locations. So in warehouses, you could actually train, you know, for a specific map and then just use it in that particular warehouse. But the methods do generalize beyond that. Um, although, of course, right, whenever generalization is involved, the performance will go down, you know, to, to some degree. Um, how to uh, evaluate the, the performance. Um, so uh, you can just, uh, just figure out, you know, how good the plans are in measuring, you know, the, the objective that you're interested in. Uh, it could be uh, make spend, for example, or flu time. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, just figure out, you know, what is the optimal solution for this. You can use a planner. Um, then you can figure out, you know, how well the machine learning system is doing. And that gives you the performance of that system compared to optimal. Okay, thank you, Sven. Um, I have a, it's a couple of minutes for questions. I have one maybe specific question, and then maybe I'll end up with a more general question. Um, so this is for Professor Bilkina. Um, so I, I really like all these uh, kind of um, uh, machine learning methods applied to kind of classical search algorithms and. and and these more structured kind of algorithms. So I guess how far are we from designing the kind of one algorithm to rule of the MP complete problems? No, you can solve mixed intelligent program, mixed integer linear programming problems. Can you solve SAD? Can you reduce 
any other kind of problem into one of these algorithms and then just kind of have one algorithm. So what, what, what are your thoughts on, on, on that? Uh, Actually, I think my talk made exactly the opposite statement. In a sense, <laughs> if we if we try to have the, this uh, golden rule or algorithm that rules them all, what happens is that we actually end up the only performance. Uh, you know, is we are stuck with the worst case that these problems are NP hard, and I think in fact, in injecting machine learning and algorithm design allows you to specialize to sub problems, right? To particular distribution of warehouse planning problems, a particular distribution of transportation uh, disaster mitigation planning problems. And so in a sense, it's actually saying you shouldn't have one algorithm that you expect to work well on average on all these different applications, but that by allowing it to learn, you can expect it to actually have a better average case performance on a, you know, a restricted domain of problems without even actually you being able to say, oh, this is going to be only on, on graphs X, Y, Z and somehow exploiting that, but allowing it to learn what the distribution looks like and what kind of strategy works on it, right? So, yeah. so I think the idea is not to do that, not to create one <laughs> silver bullet, but to actually allow for the systems to figure out what are the specialized strategies uh, for different kinds well, of well, well, what I what I meant is that I mean in a sense you have the algorithm. The algorithm is I'm going to train it on a bunch of in my distribution of problems and then right. I just let it learn the distribution and then it will do well on average on this distribution. So in a sense it's still kind of a general algorithm. It's still I mean you're not solving MP completeness because it is MP complete. Uh, right. but you still have an algorithm that will adapt to any kind of domain if you give it enough training. No? Is that yeah. one way of saying it? Okay, I understand what, what, what you're saying. Maybe, but the thing is that in a sense what I uh, by saying that the, the pure deep learning approaches don't work and the algorithmic algorithmic bias is important, right? We start from an algorithmic template and within it we learn. You can take that uh, additionally of saying, well, for different types of problems, maybe the algorithmic template, that algorithmic inductive bias is different, that there might not be one algorithmic template as much as it has learnable components and so on that would really work very well for all problems. So I feel like, I, I, I guess I'm a big proponent that there is real world problems have structure and we have to learn how to um, kind of um, exploit it. So to do that, you want to have some of this. Um, okay, I think, uh, thank you. So I think we, we run out of time. Uh, I hope you are all inspired. I am certainly inspired to read all the papers of all the, all the papers of all the speakers and I hope the audience is uh, inspired too. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Rosa Luis and Bistra, Jan, Satish, Sven. Very nice session. Thank you. Uh, the rest of the morning will be devoted to health, AI and health. Um, we will resume at 15 minutes past the hour uh, with a keynote. We will see you then. <laughs>